Hello everyone, welcome to Hindsight Rewrites, where we go into some B-movies or lesser known movies and change a little of this, change a little of that, just have a little fun with it. If you'd like an overview of some of the criteria I use for these rewrites, uh, go check out the series intro video, which is on the channel, and then come on back. Today's rewrite is for 2015's Shark Exorcist. Now, very much like a previous rewrite I did, Birdemic, this film has a very infamous reputation for being very bad and gets uh, bagged on quite a bit, and rightfully so in some cases, and we'll get into a lot of that uh, later, but for now, it just seemed like a good candidate to go in there and see is it really as bad as everybody says? Everybody seems to claim there's not really a plot there. I think there is. It's buried, but it's there, and we'll get into that. The film was released by Stratosphere Entertainment and Suicidal Productions. I wasn't able to pull up much, if anything, on Stratosphere, but I did find a website for Suicidal Productions and seen that they had another couple movies besides Shark Exorcist, one of which is titled Demon Queen and is directed by Donald Farmer, who is the same director for this film. I will leave a link to that website in the description. On top of those companies, the film was distributed by Wild Eye Releasing. One of their other more famous releasings is The Amazing Bulk. Like uh, the previous website, I will leave a link to Wild Eye's website in the description as well. As I do with all the rewrites, I'm going to send you to a more traditional review of the film. This time I'll be sending you to I Hate Everything's review of this film. Now I've sent you to him before for Verdemic, and I really kind of feel bad, but he is my favorite review for this film. So what I'm going to do is send you to Weird Movies with Mark as well for his Birdemic review so that you can just get a little variety of a bunch of these different reviewers. I will leave a link to both reviews, which I enjoy tremendously, in the description. So there's a few different posters that may pop up when you search for this film, but there's two that show up more than any others, and that is this one and then this other one. Uh, one of them might be from one Wild Eye distributed, and they sometimes will change the art from the original. I don't know uh, which one's Wild Eye or which one's you know Stratosphere and Suicidal. Either way, I prefer the one on the right. Uh, I like the incorporation of the cross into the title, and I just I just like that look better. So we're starting out here with our thumbs down guy, but it's a thumbs down guy with understanding because I've been there. I know how hard, if not impossible, it is to film at night. I've tried to do it a couple different times with mixed results, so I get it. But this atmosphere you're trying to catch with the nun walking through the graveyard, we gotta do it, you know, in the morning or in the evening. We can't be having this, you know, high noon, bright blue sky type stuff. We gotta have at least lower light situations if we can't do it actual dark. So for the rewrite, and having going back and not being able to shoot at night just like they couldn't as it seems uh, you would just go with earlier in the morning and that's what we're doing here with this filter on the screen uh, from the editor it's just to mimic morning you know the nun's been out doing evil shit all night and now she's wandering through this graveyard early early in the morning so for our first little audio segment I had to use a TTS text-to-speech uh, voice deal uh, to pull out and mimic what the original audio was saying, there's like a, it's like a news report or a police report that we're hearing, you know, kind of voiceover type deal. And I really wanted to have that on there, but I couldn't get that original audio pulled out just enough to be, you know, where I liked it enough for uh, volume purposes or whatever. So I did this, no disrespect to the original. I just went this route, uh, but again, no disrespect in that regard. Um, I just had to do this uh, for audible reasons. A statewide search continues this morning for 24-year-old Vanessa Blair. Miss Blair, a Catholic nun, has been implicated in the torture and death of 14 local boys and girls. So we got our thumbs down guy here again, and that is just, uh, again, with the lighting, but also just, you know, the wider shots that are showing a lot of the background. I get you can't close a park for your production. It's a low-budget, small production. So you just got to get creative by pointing away from different things. So these wider shots are like we see with the nun here where you're pointing towards the road in behind you. We just, that's a no. Uh, so we just got to go a different way with that. 
From the graveyard, we will cut to this B-roll shot of the water splashing up onto the shore, then back to the nun, as she's now standing along the shore, just standing there in silence, looking out at the morning sky, listening to the, uh, the waves and the wind. Then we see a woman start to move up behind her, and eventually when she gets close enough, the woman reaches out and turns Sister Blair around to confront her. You bitch, I know what you did! Everyone knows you did it! I'm gonna make sure they punish you! And I won't stop until you're rotting in hell! So in response to the confrontation, Sister Blair pulls a knife from her robes on the woman, but from there we're going to have to go to our thumbs down guy because once more we are pointed in the wrong direction with busy traffic in behind a murder, and that's probably not a good idea. So we're going to have to play with this scene a little bit, but still get what we need across. So for here and a few other spots, we got our thumbs down guy, and he's kind of reluctant because I've had to do gore stuff before with injuries and blood, especially when the actor has to actually ingest it to some degree, or at least have it in their mouth to spit it out. But there are recipes for like corn syrup and things that can get it a little closer to real. It doesn't have to be 100% real. I know we're going for campy and, and fun kind of B-movie, but we, we gotta get closer. From Sister Blair pulling the knife, we're gonna cut to a tight shot of our victim. She's being stabbed off screen and spitting out blood on screen. Then we see her fall to the ground, maybe she flails around a little, but then eventually she's dead. And Sister Blair comes and grabs her and begins to drag her towards the water. We cut to a pair of b-roll shots. The first one, once again, is just the water splashing up on the shore, similar to the one we had before. Our second b-roll shot here is of these concrete steps that lead down to the water, and they are filled with blood as... Sister Blair has dragged her victim down to the water's edge. Lord Satan, accept my sacrifice! Send me an avenger! Our evil nun pushes her victim into the water and watches as the body begins to float away. So from our floating victim, we do cut to our first look at the shark, but we also see there are thumbs down guys hanging out underwater too, if that's what you want to call this background. Now, I am not a VFX expert, nor will I ever pretend to be, but I would think you got to be able to get a better background. I don't really care about the shark. It don't have to be real. It's a demon. It's fine. But we got to get the background at least a little closer. Throw a GoPro underwater, something. Um, so we're going to be playing with that. So as you can see with our background here, we're going to be really leaning heavy into the demon and the devil and, and all of that. Uh, the exorcist element, because I don't know why you wouldn't. I think they missed an opportunity. Yeah, they had the orange glowing eyes, but I don't think that's enough to stand apart from the other Diamond Dozen Shark movies. So this will at least be like, hey, there's that one with all the fire and shit underwater. So we're going to lean that way uh, with our demon shark, with our exorcist shark. And um, I think that's the route they should have went in the first place. So from our nun kicking her victim into the water, we see the body float away, and then we get a cut underwater to our new background. And instead of seeing the shark right away, we're just seeing this fire bubbling up from the bottom of the lake. So we go back to the surface to see that the body has floated a little further away from shore. Then we go back to underwater, and we get our first look at the shark. As I said, we're keeping the original shark in all of um, his designs. I'm not changing the shark at all. And we're leaning real heavy into the fire. So we got this demonic symbol in behind and more fire and the embers. And we just watch him as he approaches and that'll cut us into our title sequence. So with this title sequence, I'm not really a fan. I don't mind the this little bit right here even though our thumbs down guy's there. But other than that, the font, the color, and then our main titles, which appear at this random you know, aquarium. Yes, there's a shark there, but a lot of other sea creatures. That's your only connection. Plus, we're going demon shark. Like I said, we're leaning heavy into it. So we're going to go a different route with more thematically appropriate uh, titles. So I'm keeping this shot from the original because I really like that blood red that kind of came over the water for this shot. And that's where we'll put our studio credits. We'll also put our movie title on top of that and just like that poster that I preferred we're using the cross as the T in the title there. 
So after we hold on our title for a few moments, we'll begin to zoom in on it, specifically onto the cross. Then fire begins to burn, and we get our cast credits to begin with, and that will then dissolve into this picture of a nun, a Sister Blair, standing uh, in front of an altar. We get our cast credits again, some more. That'll dissolve into this ancient book with sharks and so forth in it. That's where our production credits will start. And then that will dissolve into just this very um, fire and brimstone um, shark with uh, the last of our production credits. From our opening credits, we cut to a year later where we have this wide shot of a car approaching containing three young women who are on their way to enjoy a day at the park slash beach. 100 degrees outside and this car's got no air conditioning. Real nice. Lauren, we're almost there, okay? You said that like two hours ago. Yeah, well look, there's a sign right there. So we're here at No More Bitching, all right? Yeah, Lauren, be nice to Emily. Thanks, Allie. I'm always nice, but if this isn't one amazing water park, I'm gonna be one pissed BFF. Okay, this is not a water park. Well, is there at least a wave pool? Okay, what about just a lake? Do you not understand? The conversation actually goes quite a bit longer with Lauren basically just bitching and bitching and bitching about not being a water park. But we're just gonna leave it uh, with the information we have because that's all we need for that scene. So we'll cut to uh, channeling our inner Tarantino and show her feet out the window and then to an establishing of the park sign uh, where we're just trying to, again, establish the um, you know, swim at your own risk uh, part of the sign. When they reach the park, Emily and Lauren decide they want to go work on their tan. At least that's what they say in the original. That's gotten a lot of criticism, and I can see it. It's just a bit of an overcast day. There is some sun, but I don't think it's tanning weather. So we're just going to go with Emily and Lauren deciding to just go relax, lay out their towels, enjoy the day. There is some sun out, and it looks like a relatively nice day outside of just not being tanning weather. So they're going to go do that, and Allie stays behind to call her boyfriend. So here's where we start getting into some of that buried plot that I mentioned before. Uh, it begins with uh, Allie's boyfriend, which is kind of glossed over in the original. So she's on the phone trying to call him he doesn't answer so she leaves a message very agitated so that definitely tells us that this isn't the first time that he's been you know let's say hard to reach so she leaves kind of an angry message like just call me when you get this and then hangs up so the other two do bring this up a little bit with bobby ali's boyfriend emily suspects that he is cheating lauren is just kind of dismissive of it and then they go into a bit of a tangent about how Lauren's forgetful or she doesn't really notice things or listen very well. And that's how we kind of get off the subject. But the seeds have been planted that maybe Lauren uh, knows more about Bobby's cheating than uh, she's letting on. But I really like how, um, at least if they left that ambiguous, I'm not really a fan of the dialogue that they have back and forth. But I do like where they're implying that Lauren is perhaps... Uh, in on or knows about the cheating uh, with Allie's boyfriend. So we cut to Allie in the water. She's waiting out to take a swim. We watch as she goes a little further and a little further and eventually dives into a bit of a deeper part. After she splashes into that deeper area and begins to just kind of, you know, play around a little bit, we cut to underwater and again we see the signs of our shark but not the shark himself. Then back up top to Allie. She's just there. She's treading water. She's hanging out. Back underwater, we then see our shark exit this portal. As I said, we're leaning into this demonic stuff. Why not? So he exits this portal and then does like a swim by where his fin brushes Allie's leg as she's treading. We go back above water. She's very freaked out at this and begins to make a beeline back towards shore. Here we got our thumbs down guy again. That's because in the original, as you can see there, they're in very shallow water. She shows her feet kind of flopping up. Uh, not a very good way to mimic a shark attack. So from Alley swimming towards shore, we'll cut back to underwater where the shark opens wide and there's a big old fireball inside there waiting for Alley. We cut above the water, uh, this time kind of cropped in a little tighter so we don't see her legs and everything. And she just screams out in pure agony. 
This alerts the other two that something's wrong. Emily tells Lauren to go get help, and she uh, makes her own beeline towards the water to aid her friend. So when Emily gets to the shore, she can see the alley is just under the water there. You can see that bit of pink from her swimsuit. And she just managed to escape the shark, but she did catch a case of the thumbs down guy. And that is because, like we mentioned earlier with the stabbing in the cold open, um, there are ways around with the effects, whether that's, you know, some different kinds of blood or mixtures, or you just, you know, cut away from it. You know, kind of avoid showing it. One or the other, but, you know, just popping some basically ketchup, and not so much. Emily pulls Allie from the water, and we do cut down to our wound that I've dressed up with some cheap online stuff. Uh, in any event, it still looks a little cheesy, but we got this, you know, more gnarly looking wound with the black in there from the burning of the fireball. And then we cut back up to Emily just screaming, Lauren, Lauren, come on, we need help now. In the original, they cut to some hospital footage that they may or may not have had permission to film. We will get to some of that later for some other purposes. For now, we're just going to go to this ambulance, which could be acquired through stock, um, going uh, through the streets, carrying the injured alley. So I'm about to play some audio from a news report uh, from Brian Bennett here, who's describing the shark attack. But I'm wanting to change a little bit of the context. I'm still going to play the audio, but we're just going to, like I've done with some other rewrites, where we're changing the context a little bit. So in his original report, he talks about many or multiple shark attacks. In terms of our rewrite, he's going to be just referring to the one, which is Allie's shark attack. I've also changed the layout of like where the news stuff is and everything but that's not really a knock on them it's more just my personal preference on how I wanted it to be laid out so a little bit of a different layout uh, as far as presentation and you know the singular shark attack instead of multiple this is Brian Bennett with Channel 9 News live from Paris Landing currently the entire area has been closed while police try to determine if the reports are true and in fact a man-eating shark is loose in these waters stay tuned to Channel 9 News for more on this developing story so a lot of the reviews for this film including the one I sent you to from I Eat Everything don't really like uh, the transition to the shark arcade game or even the inclusion of it I don't mind it I didn't even like the visual of coming from that report to that so that's what we're gonna do we're gonna come from that news report to our shark arcade game and Lauren is playing it we watch her play the game a little bit then she gets a call from Emily on her cell then we cut to this wider shot of Lauren uh, leaving the arcade so this is part of the original film where they have just a super awkward conversation about you know, why Lauren hasn't been to see Allie, and that Allie is actually miraculously healed from her injuries. Instead, we're going to have Allie still be in the hospital, and what Emily's doing here is she's just sitting down and telling Lauren as much uh, that she's still in critical condition in the ICU. She hasn't been able to see her because they won't let non-family in there, but she has been getting updates from the staff and so forth that it seems like Allie's going to pull through. Lauren isn't quite the clueless or kind of bitch that she is in the original, but she's still a bit dismissive, and when she's pushed on why she's being so uh, by Emily, she just gets up and walks away. From Emily sitting confused on the bench from Lauren's walk-off, we dissolve to this hospital hallway, establishing shot, and from there we will come to inside the hospital room where Allie is just sleeping peacefully, hooked up to the machines, and just originally having a nice dream, but then she starts to kind of stir around a little bit as her dreams become a little more aggressive we start seeing flashes uh, which are meant to represent inside of her mind or in her dream of not just her shark attack but also like what we saw in the opening titles with the evil nun at the altar and the, the demonic book that we saw in the credits and we get back and forth between her personal attack and those images and we end on this just image of this flaming mouth of shark everything's kind of blurred because it's a dream and we get Ali just sitting up in a cold sweat we hold on a very shaken Ali as she just sits there 
and begins to kind of cry a little bit from that nightmare and fade briefly to black. So from our black, we fade into the opening of a paranormal TV show hosted by a woman named Nancy Chase. Before I get into our audio for that scene, I'd like to point out our thumbs down guy here, because during that scene in the original film, she turns away from her cameraman and breaks the fourth wall while still doing her spiel for the show. So I'm not sure what they were thinking on that, or if they were thinking, um, I don't mind showing her like with her face away from us towards the camera I don't mind her facing you know without the cameraman in sight because then we can just imply that he's the one filming her but having him stand behind her and her facing away from him yeah, that's no that, that's definitely a no so once again I'm gonna play a bit of audio for you but I'd like to add a little more context to it before I do so uh, as opposed to when we had our earlier news report, since Allie's attack now, there have been three other women that have been attacked and killed. So Allie, to this point, is the only survivor. And now we have this ghost lady um, wanting to go over what happened to these other three women and perhaps commune with their spirits. Hello, I'm Nancy Chase, and welcome to another episode of Ghost Whackers, where we explore the paranormal, the supernatural, and the unexplained. Today, I'm at Paris Landing, the scene of a strange series of attacks that turned beautiful bodies into blood-soaked, mangled corpses. Reports claim a giant shark is feeding on the swimmers. Is that really true? Three women have died here. Do their souls still remain to give us the answers? I want to create a psychic link with the troubled spirits. From there, Nancy walks down the dock towards the shore. Here I don't mind the cameraman being behind her because he's doing like a follow. So that's okay. And even in that shot there, you can see when she turns to talk to him, she's actually turning at least half towards the camera. So I'll, I'll allow that. When she gets to the shore, she starts playing with the water and doing some prayers or chants or whatever, you know, some weird seancey stuff. And at first, nothing happens. But as she continues, suddenly we begin to see flashes of um, the evil shark with his you know, fire and his demonic symbol in behind him. And then we flash back to Nancy as she's feeling the effects. She falls on the ground, begins to seize around. Again, back and forth, we're getting these flashes between her on the ground and the shark. Now, in the original, she does like this whole where she speaks in like his dark voice or whatever. We're not doing that. We're just having her convulsing around on the ground. And then, you know, that going in between shots of her doing that and, um, you know, the imagery from the shark. Final flash reveals Nancy has passed out from the ordeal. We hold on her and then dissolve to a wide shot of Emily and Allie walking in a park. In the original, you could hear the voiceover from Allie and Emily talking with each other in this wide shot, but instead we're just going to hold on that without them saying anything. They're just walking closer towards the camera. Then we'll cut to close on them uh, for their conversation. So, Emily starts out the conversation by saying it's so great they were able to miraculously heal like that. Like, you know, one minute you're in the ICU and the next you're, you know, up and walking around. It's just so unbelievable. Allie is quite defensive as, and maybe has a bit of an attitude to her as she reaches down to the last bit of bandages that are just more for show with the injury totally gone. What, would you rather that I was still laying in a hospital bed fighting for my life. Emily's taken back by this attitude. No, I didn't mean it like that. I'm just, it's a miracle, but also kind of odd. Allie lets out an angry uh, sigh. She's still got that edge, that attitude that we didn't see her have before the attack. She looks back at Emily. Well, maybe instead of being confused, you should be happy that I was able to heal and survive such a gruesome attack. Emily initially moves to follow, but instead stops, crosses her arms, and decides to give Allie some space. However, she's still very, very confused at her friend's attitude change. 
From Emily, we cut to Ally putting on her sunglasses and walking away. So here I want to address a few of our thumbs down guys, as well as you know, how we're going to kind of reutilize some of this into a usable scene later. Here, uh, just she's not going to be hitchhiking, and therefore, uh, coming into our next still here, we're not going to have her picked up by this guy in the SUV. This is also the same actor that plays the priest, so there's no need to double him up as the guy that picks her up, and then they end up in the water, you know, doing you know, romantic things together before Ellie, you know, goes underwater and the shark attack and all the rest. We don't need to reutilize this guy, you know, or double up this guy, because we have this other fella from a later scene who is just basically being a creeper in that scene it's the most useless scene on the face of the freaking planet so we're just gonna move that guy um, more into this attack scene instead from Ellie walking away from her conversation with Emily we dissolve to this shot of the water we hold on that until we then see Ellie walk into frame and she begins to just kind of play around with the water. You see her almost in a motion similar to what our psychic or ghost whacker host had, where she's just kind of motioning on the water. On the shore, our creepy guy is taking photos of Allie as she's, you know, doing her motions and everything in the water. She notices, turns around, and invites him to join her. He's reluctant at first, but eventually, after some more prompting from Allie, begins to wade out and joins her in the water. She teases and swims around our creepy fella uh, a little while before eventually dipping under the water. We cut to a shot under the water of her lower half hovering above the lake floor and we get our you know our embers and our fire and a bit of our shark coming out from under the lake floor. Back on the surface our creepy guy sees embers begin to come up from the water He's very confused, but his confusion can't last very long as he is suddenly pulled under. From underwater, we see our victim come face to face with the demon shark, then back to the surface where he is desperately trying to swim to shore. Again, we're seeing these embers coming up from the waves. Back underwater, our shark is opening his mouth to do his fireball thing. Back on the surface, our victim has made it to a railing, but he's quickly overwhelmed by fire that turns to steam as he is pulled under. With the deed done, our shark moves back into his demonic portal, and we come back to the surface where Allie has come up, and she's surrounded by the steam from the attack, and we fade to black. After briefly holding on the black, we'll fade back in on this exterior shot of a church. Inside, we're introduced to Father Michael, who's reading a piece of paper. An insert shot shows us that it's a newspaper article that is highlighting, on one side, Allie's attack with pictures of her and her injury. On the other side, you see Nancy Chase and a small article about her suspecting demonic involvement. When we cut back to Father Michael, he doesn't say a word. Instead, just has a very concerned look on his face eventually putting his head down into his hands in a praying motion that ends the scene. We addressed this thumbs down guy earlier, but we're going to do it again briefly, which is just Nancy Chase doing her show, but facing away from her cameraman towards the main, the movie camera, which would be fine if he wasn't also in the shot. So once again, no. So we cut to some of these other shots that don't show him, where she is just going over what happened the last time, that we seen her, which was she tried to make a psychic connection to the shark victims and ended up realizing that there is a demonic connection with the shark. Nancy is interrupted by Brianna Bennett, the host of a rival show that debunks paranormal claims. Nancy's cameraman keeps rolling while the two argue back and forth about the validity of Nancy's claims as far as the demon shark goes. Brianna, of course, thinks that the shark attacks are real, but just that, shark attacks, and accuses Nancy of using these real tragedies to boost her ratings. Nancy really genuinely believes there's a demon involved and tries to tell Brianna about her experience with the flashes when she tried to make a connection before. Brianna's not having any of it and storms off. Nancy is 
a combination of pissed and frustrated because she actually does want to try to help these people in her own way and she shows that frustration towards her cameraman that dissolves us to an establishing shot of the church with the tent here suggesting it's now evening Father Michael exits the church and begins to walk towards camera but he stops pulls out his phone and looks down at it. An insert shows us that he's looking at a digital version of the demonic shark book. Like before, we're going to go over a few of our thumbs down guy scenes because, uh, as I mentioned towards the beginning of this rewrite, there is a plot, uh, not a lot, but there is a plot here and it's buried under a lot of useless scenes and starting here, this is one of them. These three ladies that kind of do this little seance in broad ass daylight. Yeah, it's gone. Then we cut to very, very uncomfortable scene with this, let's just say, uh, mentally um, handicapped person. I, I don't even know how to describe her. Um, definitely not right. And you have this, you know, where she's sort of seduced. I know it ends up being like a dream, but it's just, it's not cool. So we're getting rid of it. We're also giving a thumbs down guy and just getting rid of this scene where this guy is just running and running and running. I don't mind a little establishing, especially since he ends up finding like one of the bodies, but just the nature of how he finds the body and some inappropriate comments he makes when he finds the body. No, no. So I'm just we're scrapping the entire thing. So in our attempt to get some kind of through line or some sort of plot, we circle back here to Father Michael's insert shot. And that transition us to this woman, again with the tent suggesting evening. She's running away from something, but we're not sure what. A wider shot shows us that she is running through a cemetery, but eventually falls down. On the ground, the woman is begging and pleading with an unseen pursuer. Please, please stop. Why are you doing this? We cut to reveal that the pursuer is actually Allie who is standing there with a cold stare. Sister Blair sends her regards. The woman suddenly screams out in agony as steam begins to emit from the ground along with some embers and engulfs her. We cut back to Allie where the steam and embers are engulfing her as well. Vengeance has come for you, Lily. Here we're going to cut in along with Lily's struggle with the steam and the shark Nancy Chase on the shore once more trying to connect with the spirits or the shark that she saw before. Instead she sees flashes of Lily underwater with that demonic symbol behind her just very freaked out, very scared. We come back to Nancy now writhing around on the ground. Her cameraman's like, I'm out of here. Screw this. With the cameraman gone, Nancy continues to writhe on the ground, continuing to get flashes of Lily's struggle with the shark as it opens its mouth and consumes her with a fireball. A flashback to Nancy shows that she's arched her back, eyes wide open, and screaming out in pure agony, very similarly to what we saw with Lily at the graveyard. However, Nancy doesn't have the steam coming up around her like Lily did. Final flash from Nancy gives us a shot of the water where steam and embers are coming up from the area where Lily had been consumed beneath the waves. Another cut reveals that Allie is on the shore, also shrouded in steam and embers, staring out at the water and laughing. We hold on Allie and fade to an establishing of she and Emily's house. A few moments later, we have Emily enter frame and go up to Allie's bedroom door. She knocks and knocks a few times, asking for Allie. When there's no reply, she cautiously goes inside the room. She looks around the room a little bit before taking a seat on the bed. Very concerned for her friend, she blurts out, Allie, what's going on with you? We hold on Emily's very concerned look and then dissolve to an establishing of a parking lot for the next scene. Here we're introduced to Sheila, the head of a sorority who's brought two pledges, Holly and Michelle, to Paris Landing for a bit of hazing. Do you know where we are? Uh, the beach? Not just any beach. This is Paris Landing. 
Wait, isn't that where all the shark attacks happen? Good job, Holly. High five. Wait, so there's a shark in the water? I don't know. Maybe it got bored and swam away. That's what you guys are here to find out. Us? Of course. You guys are gonna swim out for exactly 10 minutes, as far as you can. And if you make it back without becoming shark bait, consider yourselves official sisters of Gamma Zeta Beta! From there we cut to Michelle and Holly standing in the water. As you can see, they're about knee deep, not even that. But they are just scared shitless to go out there because of the recent shark attacks. While the two pledges are trying to psych each other up, come on, come on Holly, we can do this. Up on the bridge, Sheila's yelling at them, Hurry up! I have a date with Bobby. Don't make me late. The mention of her cheating boyfriend causes Allie to appear in the midst of some smoke on the shore. From there we cut to underwater where our shark is once again coming up from beneath the lake floor. The frightened pledges are still not really budging that much and they're being berated by Sheila up on the bridge. Underwater our demon shark emerges from his portal. Up top, Sheila continues to yell at her pledges, do it now or you can kiss membership in the sorority goodbye. So here's our thumbs down guy because in the original, for this attack, they had basically looks like some stock shark footage and then they put some filter and tinting on it. We're not going to do that, it looks stupid so we're going to go a different direction. From Sheila yelling on the bridge, we cut to underwater where now we see our shark in a closer view with the fire beginning to build in his mouth. A sudden flash takes us back up top where Sheila is screaming out in pain, engulfed in flames. Holly and Michelle watch on in horror as Sheila burns. From there we cut to Allie, who still in the midst of her smoke, is watching on with much more enjoyment. Then she slowly fades away into the smoke and we cut to black. We fade back in from our black to this establishing shot of Nancy Chase standing awkwardly in front of this columned building. A wider shot here shows us Brianna Bennett on the phone with her producer. In the original, she is going to take Nancy down or confront her. Here, I want her to be on the phone with, again, still her producer who has called her to tell her about the sorority girl attack and about what the witnesses were saying with the fire and everything. So now, she actually maybe at least a little believes Nancy and she wants to go talk to her about that. She goes up into the structure and slowly begins to follow Nancy who is walking very, very strangely. And Brianna observes this for a little while, walks in behind her, doesn't really say much. Then eventually says, Nancy, I need to talk to you. Nancy spins around and begins to slowly make her way towards Brianna without saying a single word. Brianna is very taken back. Are you alright? Nancy. But she doesn't get a reply, but it becomes very apparent that something is not right with the paranormal investigator. Brianna is knocked down and attacked by the deranged Nancy. At first she tries to fight it off, but Nancy is able to eventually get a hold of her. And now, as opposed to earlier, we will get her talking in that kind of lower voice, almost channeling the demon, Burn in the fires of vengeance. Brianna's scream is mixed with the sound of door knocking as we dissolve to this establishing of Emily and Allie's house. Emily answers the door and it's Father Michaels who has come to see Allie. After formal introductions, Emily tells him that Allie is not there. He says that that's all right because he also would like to talk to Emily about the incident. Emily agrees and leads him to the next room where she takes a seat and Father Michaels begins to tell her about what he knows. I know what happened to your friend, Allie, and how she was attacked by a shark three weeks ago. Everybody knows about that. I mean, it was all over the paper. I mean, it was kind of crazy though, right? A shark in this part of our town? Don't they normally live in the ocean? Normally, but we're not talking about a normal shark here. That's why I'm concerned for Allie. Allie's fine. I mean, she was healed, like, miraculously. But this wouldn't have anything to do with why she's acting weird, would it? How, how weird is she acting? I don't know. It's, it's weird. She's, like, sleeping all the time, never eating, barely talking to anybody, and she's obsessed with water. I mean, everything has to do with water. She has to be in it or around it. It's almost like she's, I don't know. 
Yes? Effed up. Like, a lot. There's something I need to tell you. Emily shifts in her seat. All right. What is it? Father Michaels takes a deep breath, and here's where we're going to get our big exposition dump and kind of tie up some of these things with Father Michael's explanation of the situation. This fades us into Father Michael's going over a recap of the cold open with Sister Blair and her murder of not just the gal that we saw in the cold open, but all those other boys and girls that the news report had mentioned uh, during that same cold open. Police who had already been looking for her confronted Sister Blair shortly after she had put the woman, her victim, her sacrifice, into the water. Now in terms of our criteria for these rewrites of not having brand new actors come in, having you know, repurposed actors, we will have the uh, police officer woman be played by one of these three ladies that we cut earlier. The officer pulls her weapon and orders Sister Blair to surrender. The evil nun is wanting none of this, pulls her knife and begins to aggressively approach the officer. The officer shouts a few more orders again, stop, stop, then fires. Sister Blair is shot and falls into the water. I'm confused, Father Michaels. What does all this have to do with Allie? Everything, Father Michaels replies as he continues his story. Father Michaels explains that he was called in to help with the investigation since Sister Blair was into some kind of dark, satanic stuff. While investigating, they ran across her little lair where she had done the demonic rituals. Michaels explains that while they were in the lair, they found a very old book that contained a vengeance ritual consisting of summoning a demon shark. We dissolve out of Father Michael's story where the picture from that book is now being displayed on Emily's laptop. The priest continues to explain that the shark, when summoned, still needs a connection to our plane or our world, and that would have been Sister Blair. But when she died, the shark no longer had that connection. So that should have sent the shark back to hell or wherever it came from, right? priest shakes his head. I don't think so. I think it just went dormant until it could find another suitable connection or suitable host, for lack of a better term. Emily, I believe based on your description earlier that the shark has came out of dormancy and connected itself to Allie. Since it is a demon of vengeance, it will fulfill its earlier mission from Sister Blair, but also for its new host. Is there anything that you can think of, or anyone that you can think of, that Allie would want vengeance on? Emily shakes her head at first. No, no, she was a happy, chipper person, at least until the attack. The only thing that really was going on with her was she had some issues with her boyfriend cheating on her. Oh, shit. Would that do it? The priest nods. If she was angry enough, did Allie know who he was cheating with? I think he was sleeping around with a bunch of different ones. Do you know who any of them are? Emily pauses, then her eyes get wide. We have to go. Now. That dissolves us into an establishing of this carnival. After another establishing from the carnival, we cut to Allie, who is walking through, clearly looking for something or someone. Allie finds what she's looking for when Lauren and Bobby enter the carnival. Lauren is being very playful and fun while Bobby is being a bit dismissive. We cut to Allie who has an icy cold stare and that cuts us back to Emily and Father Michaels as they rush to the car to go to the rescue. So when we cut back here to the carnival I just want to point out that in the original they had um, issues with audio it seemed because they didn't have the actors talking they couldn't maybe get over the carnival sounds or whatever and that's fine so we'll do the same thing here where it's all just motions and looks expressions until we get to some of these later scenes at the carnival where we did have some talking in the original 
Back at the carnival, after we get our establishing of that Ferris wheel, we cut to Lauren and Bobby, again, with just motions and expressions. She's wanting to go up on that Ferris wheel, and he doesn't, so he turns and he walks away. She um, looks disappointed for a few moments and then follows. A cut over to Allie, again, just observing the two, shows that she's maybe just waiting to pick her spot. Lauren comes up to Bobby and continues to keep, you know, poking at him, playing around, just just being fun and playful. He seems to ease up a little, and the two start walking towards some more rides. In behind them, Allie begins to slowly creep, but not too suspiciously, uh, to follow. From there, we cut to Father Michaels and Emily arriving at the carnival. They have looks of urgency and concern on their face as they try to quickly, but not too quickly, make their way through the carnival. Once more, Lauren is being very playful, gesturing that she wants to go on the ride that they're in front of now. Bobby, again, just has gone back to that dismissive. Maybe he would rather be here with Sheila, who we know he was supposed to meet instead. So he kind of just disses Lauren and walks away. This time she doesn't follow and just stands there with a disappointing look before moving in the opposite direction out of frame. So we get this shot of the ride that Lauren wanted to go on, which is this spooky kind of haunted house type thing. And that has the vampires on there, which gives us a contrast. When we cut to Allie, who is now opening her mouth and showing these kind of shark teeth, she's not turning into a shark person or anything like that. It's more of the demon operating through her uh, with its powers just kind of coming through instead of you know, her being like, transformed or anything like that. From Allie burying her shark teeth, we cut to the priest and Emily continuing to search through the carnival looking for her or Lauren or Bobby. After leaving Lauren, Bobby has gone over to this building where he's just kind of standing and brooding. Allie sneaks up behind him. When Bobby thinks he hears something behind him, which we know there's someone there, he turns around, but there's nothing there. It's just empty. Confused, he turns back the other direction, this time attacked viciously by Allie. Bobby screams out in pain as Allie tears at his throat with her shark teeth. Then, Father Michaels and Emily show up. Michaels holds up a cross. The power of Christ compels you! Once the words are spoken, light begins to emanate from the cross. Allie opens her mouth, burying her teeth, but is quickly consumed by light as Father Michaels continues to say the phrase over and over. The power of Christ compels you. The power of Christ compels you. Light emanates brighter and brighter and brighter, eventually drowning out the screen and fading us out of the scene. I'm speaking to the demon who possesses this woman. Demon, do you hear me? I'm ordering you to cease your evil and corruption. Demon, be gone! We're gonna need a bigger cross. Emily, stay back. What are you going to do? I'm going to perform the holy rite of exorcism. It's the only way to save your friend. So after a little rousing intro to the scene, we got our thumbs down guy being a bit of a downer, but that's okay. He has a good reason. The scene continues with the father and Allie bargaining, or more so the demon bargaining with the priest, and then he lets his guard down and some about transferring the possession to him. A demon, especially one of vengeance, wouldn't want to be anywhere near a priest, even a corrupt one. Well, maybe a corrupt one, but in this case, he doesn't. He wants to stay in this woman that is filled with vengeance. So we're not doing where they have this bargaining back and forth. Oh, I'll let your friend go if you... Whatever. No, so we're, we're not doing that. Instead, Father Michaels holds his ground and continues with the exorcism, reciting different prayers, scriptures, the light again like before builds and builds and builds and we see Allie become consumed with it but this time she or the demon operating through her has a plan and we do get that exorcist callback which is what this movie is supposed to do uh, with the projectile vomiting going to the priest long enough to distract him so that Allie can conjure fire and break herself free from the bonds. 
Once free, Allie leaps forward, grabs the priest, spins him around, and violently pushes him against the tree. Here's the thumbs down guy again as we get more of that bargaining bullshit, as well as the priest and Allie kissing to transfer the demon or some shit. Yeah, we're not doing that. We're going to roll right into, uh, once she's pushed him against the tree, Allie just violently, similar to how she did with Bobby, leans in and bites the priest. Allie pulls back to reveal a large open wound on the priest's neck as he begins to bleed profusely. With Father Michael's out of commission, Emily picks up the cross and begins to recite the same prayers and verses that he was doing during the initial exorcism. This works temporarily, but it quickly becomes apparent she's not a priest and can't hold it like he was. The light fades and she is attacked by Allie. Allie conjures fire on Emily, causing her to scream out in pain. However, she is able to squirm away but not before we see a very similar looking wound on her leg. Our thumbs down guy appears in this scene once again, this time because in the original we have this portal that opens up in the sky as the shark comes down to attack and kill Father Michaels and Allie after Emily escapes. We're not doing that this time. So in our new version, when Emily escapes, Allie goes to give chase, but when she moves to do so, she is grabbed on the leg by a not-quite-dead Father Michaels. He has grabbed her leg with one hand, the cross with the other, and with the last few bits of life that he has left, he finishes the exorcism, which causes this, this huge flashes of light. Allie tries to conjure fire to fight with that. But he is determined, you know, using every last ounce of strength that he has in his life left. And it works, destroying them both in the process. In the original, we have this ending scene, which I mentioned earlier when we moved our creepy guy to uh, being attacked instead of our priest playing double duty. So this is what was originally the actual end scene of the movie, not even an end credit scene, like the actual ending scene, which was just this dude creeping on her. And then that rolled into like the return of the nun and her original victim. And then you had the, an end credit scene, which we're actually gonna use as our new ending scene. But then after that, you had another, another end credit scene with this lady at um, an aquarium. And then that rolls into another, 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 or I've lost count at this point, end credit scene of Nancy Chase walking around all possessed. I am going to use one of these end credit scenes, the one I have mentioned, as our new ending scene, and then I will actually give us a normal end credit scene, one of these many, or kind of a combination of a couple of them. But we're not doing, you know, four or whatever it was. That's just stupid and screams of padding time. So our final scene for the main movie will fade in from the black of the previous scene and shows us Lauren enjoying the next morning, oblivious to the previous night's events, just kind of hanging out, when she suddenly sees Emily stumbling around on the dock. Emily is stumbling around and is very disoriented, doesn't even hear or respond to Lauren who sits up in her chair and cries out, Emily, are you alright? When she doesn't get a reply, Lauren gets up to go check on her friend. Emily stops, peers down at the water, and just stares at it blankly, before finally turning back the other direction and taking off her shirt, revealing her swimsuit top underneath. She then stumbles a little further down the dock, all the while Lauren is following. Emily! Emily! What's going on? Are you alright? When Lauren stops and she picks up Emily's shirt, she's just very confused, eventually catching up with her. Lauren puts a hand on her friend's shoulder. Emily, are you alright? What's going on? Emily gently pulls away. I'm sorry, Lauren. I really am. She jumps into the water, with Lauren left very confused as she keeps crying out, Emily, Emily, Emily! as the splashes turn to ripples and then nothing. A confused Lauren just stands there. Then a large splash combines with a huge wall of fire with the shark emerging from it and Lauren screaming out 
in tear as we roll into our credits. After our credits roll for a little while, we fade into our one and only end credit scene, which begins with this car driving down the road. A news report talks about how police are looking for the missing people of Allie, Lauren, Father Michaels, and Emily. A cut to our driver mirrors a change in the news report as they slightly change topics to talk about how police and other authorities are looking for Nancy Chase in connection to the death of Brianna Bennett. The vehicle stops in Paris Landing's parking lot where our driver gets out, collects her things, and begins to move towards an open area near the lake shore. Once there, she takes off her top, again with a swimsuit underneath, lays down and enjoys the day. After laying there for a little while, she begins to hear noises, sticks breaking, rustling in the bushes, things like that. So she sits up, turns her head a little wise, doesn't see anything, lays back down, the noises repeat, she sits up. After it does it a third time, she decides to get up and kind of get out of there. When she finally gathers her things and turns to go back to her vehicle, she is met by a fully possessed, fully creepy Nancy Chase. Nancy just stands there, tilts her head a couple times, and begins to conjure a bit of fire in her hand. The woman screams out in terror, and we cut to black, officially ending the movie. After going through this movie a couple times for the rewrite, I can't really fault other reviewers who have said that there isn't really a plot. They're not wrong, but they're not right. There is the vaguest resemblance of a plot and even that is buried under a lot of just distraction and, and side jumping over here and over there like with a lot of those scenes that we talked about that we cut the through line is what really drew me to this film I love the concept and if they would have had a little more focus with the through line as far as demon shark summoned demon shark you know possesses a girl carries out vengeance on you know various people that's great and then you can even have like the side plot I don't mind a side plot like that's why I did the Nancy Chase stuff yes in the original that is probably one of the more annoying bits with her writhing around on the ground like a crazy person especially when she's screaming out like some of the things that she screams out but you know put into a little bit better context and having that kind of side thing where now we've seen kind of possession on two different levels. Allie through the attack, you know, kind of almost werewolf style, but then also with Nancy, you know, more through that psychic or spiritual link that she was doing. So there are a lot of ideas and theories through other reviewers of what was going on with this movie, why is it, you know, so disjointed, and why are some of the things the way they are, the multiple endings, and all of that. I don't want to jump into, you know, they get some kind of accusing type stuff, and I'm not going to get into that. I think what happened is the creators had an idea, inspiration, whether it's through the actual Exorcist movie or just, you know, an idea, and they wanted to, you know, I've done that, where you see a movie, and then that just gets your, your wheels turning, as it were, and I think what happened is their wheels just turned a little too much, and you had all these ideas, and instead of just focusing you know, on that or maybe even one side plot like we did here in the rewrite, they just, everything bounced all over the place and you know, we could have just used a little bit more focus I think is where we were at. Um, some of the more uncomfortable stuff didn't need to happen. You know, again, I, I get it. We're just trying to do this broad brush thing with the exorcist or the demons and all that. I think you just stay focused on the main story with you know, fully embracing the fire and stuff like we've discussed earlier in the rewrite. So, um, give it a watch, but, you know, if you're willing to kind of look deep into what this film can be or should have been, you know, with a little more focus. So, thank you for watching this episode of Hindsight Rewrites. Uh, as always, like, comment, subscribe. That really helps the channel out. Check out the Patreon if you'd like. I'll leave a link. Uh, if not, that is awesome as well, and I will see you all next time on Hindsight Rewrites.